The universe is like that, and there are things we understand about it and things we don't understand about it. And there's two temptations that work in opposite directions but are very strong. There's a temptation to say, you know what, we understand everything. Or, we don't understand everything today, but within a few years, we'll understand everything. This is a very common move in the history of physics, especially, from the 1800s up until very recently. You could talk to a physicist and they're like, you know, there's things we don't know, but it's just dotting I's and crossing T's. Any day now, we'll understand mostly everything. Very embarrassing to say those things. They never turn out to be true. I'm not going to say that, okay? But it's tempting. There's then another temptation, which is to say, we don't understand anything, right? People, scientists, talk about dark matter and dark energy in the Big Bang and quantum mechanics. Well, they don't understand any of that stuff. Therefore, anything goes. Anything could be true. Who knows, right? That is just as easy and lazy and wrong as saying that we understand everything. The hard, courageous thing is to say, well, we understand some things, we don't understand other things, and here is the dividing line between them. That's difficult, but that's what we have to do if we're honest about how we understand the world. So all that's trivial and obvious, and you understood that already. Uh, if you didn't, buy my book. Am I allowed to say that here? Sure. Buy my book. Well, they're selling it Signing right the book <laughs> afterward. My publisher likes when I say that. Okay. <laughs> Here's the surprising thing that we don't always tell you. The world appears to us in layers. There is a layer of understanding the nature of reality, which has a certain domain of validity that includes everything in this room, which we understand perfectly. Okay? It's not the layer of human interactions, right? If you meet a person and you're trying to figure out, you know, what are their motivations, are they nice? And like, we don't understand that. We're not going to understand that anytime soon. Uh, there's many things that we don't understand, but there's a layer, which is, once again, that layer of the elementary particles and forces. You and I contain atoms in our bodies. That we all agree on. Atoms are made of particles, and we know what those particles are. There's protons, there's neutrons, there's electrons, and there's forces pushing them around, right? There's electromagnetism, gravity, there's nuclear forces. So the dramatic claim that I want to make that rarely gets articulated as well as it should is that that layer, that language we have of talking about what's happening in this room right now, where it's particles interacting through the elementary forces of nature, we have that done. We have that figured out. We discovered the Higgs boson in 2012. We can argue whether or not we needed to discover that to, to count for this claim that I'm making, but it's true. We know all of the particles that you are made of. And not only by that do I mean that we've already discovered the particles we know are in you and me and the, the table and the floor, and for that matter, the sun, the moon, and the stars, but we are convinced we will never, ever, ever discover new particles that are relevant to what is happening in this room right now. And I'm saying that in very, very careful language because of course we hope we will discover some kinds of new particles. We discovered the Higgs uh, in 2012. We discovered the top quark in the late 1990s. Particle physicists like to discover new things. That's what they do for a living. We think that there is at least one particle that we haven't discovered yet, which makes up the dark matter, which is most of the matter in the universe. What I'm trying to argue is that even when we discover the dark matter, it will not be relevant to understanding the physics of you and me, to understand what we are and how we behave. The secret to our biology, our life, our nature as organic beings, our thinking, our consciousness, is not going to be found in changing those laws of physics. We know what the particles are, the fields, the forces that hold them together, and we know how they behave. And of course, don't take my word for it. Uh, I'm sure you haven't. I don't need to tell you that. There are reasons why we think this. And again, it's not just that we found some particles and we're pretty sure we're done. That would be very, very lazy, sloppy thinking if that were true. There's something very, very interesting and powerful about the way we think about this particular way of talking about nature, the way we think about talking about 
these particles and these forces. And there is a whole thing, I mean, how long do I have to talk? You said three hours? <laughs> There's a whole thing called quantum field theory, which Marcelo uh, alluded to, a way of thinking about how these particles interact that really puts very, very stringent constraints on what they can do. So here's how these constraints work. Imagine there was some particle that was really important for breathing. Okay, no one believes that's true, but just to take an anodyne example, imagine there was some new force of nature or some new elementary particle that was really crucial to understanding how we breathed, right? So you could say, well, what I'm proposing is that there is some particle and there's some number of those particles in our bodies and it helps with our respiration. What does that mean? That means that the particle exists and it means that it interacts with the particles that we are made of in a noticeable way, right? So the feature of quantum field theory is that if there exists a particle that interacts with us, then we can make it. We can create every particle that we interact with. How? By smashing other particles together, right? When we found that Higgs boson in 2012, how did we find it? We smashed together protons with each other, and we created Higgs bosons. It's not that the Higgs boson was locked inside the proton. The Higgs boson is over 100 times heavier than a proton is. But we smash these protons together with so much force that when we say particles in physics, what we really mean are vibrations in these quantum fields. And the vibrations in these fields overlapped and went crazy and started all the other fields in the universe vibrating. And one of those was a little Higgs boson, which we were able to detect. To be fair, we actually did not detect the Higgs boson. We detect the things that the Higgs boson decays into, okay? The Higgs boson decays away in about one zeptosecond, which is a very short period of time. <laughs> and we will never see a Higgs boson. It just decays away like that. And it's very hard to make. And we've smashed enough particles together in enough different ways to say with confidence that if there are other particles out there, which surely there are, then either they decay, decay away as soon as you make them, or they interact with us so weakly that we can't make them. That's what we think is, is the case with the dark matter. It's very heavy, very hard to make, and there's probably dark matter particles going through this room right now. But they go right through you. They don't interact with you. They will therefore not be important for explaining how you breathe or how you live or how you think. Globe life fart, fart, globe life fart. <laughs>